on today's story beat. You have your external rhythm, which you are creating with your cuts, right? If I put a lot of cuts, it's going to be a really fast pace, right? You're, you're making all the cuts go by really fast. All the information's going by really fast. The audience has to process it fast or they might get confused, depending. If I keep a shot on there long, now I'm slowing down the pace in some capacity. But then that's the external rhythm. Then we have internal rhythm that I think some don't keep in mind is that everything happening on screen in your shot has rhythm to it as well. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Kara Fries, is an experienced video producer, editor, and educator. She's currently the director of education for the EdTech company Edit Mentor, which teaches the art of video storytelling and the technical skills of video creation within a self-paced interactive curriculum through a cutting edge web-based platform. Before working for Edit Mentor, Kara taught editing in Point Park University's Cinema Arts Department, where she held the roles of assistant professor, head of the editing concentration, and ultimately department chair. For the record, Kara and I are longtime friends, having worked together for many years in the cinema department. Kara's production credits include working with VEX Robotics, WPXI-TV, Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and CBS's As the World Turns. She's served on the boards of the Steeltown Entertainment Project, Women in Film and Media Pittsburgh, and was a section manager for SMPTE Pittsburgh. She's also an Adobe Premier Pro Certified Expert and an Avid Media Composer Certified User. So for all those reasons and many more, it's a great joy for me to have my friend, the incredibly gifted editor, producer, and teacher, Kara Fries, as my guest on StoryBeat today. Kara, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve, and thanks for that amazing welcome. <laughs> oh, well, the, the pleasure is all mine, believe me. All right, so let's go back in time a little bit with you. Yeah. When in your life did you first realize that you liked looking at movies and that you wanted to actually work on movies or TV, that you liked this idea of motion pictures? I actually can remember the exact moment when I knew this is where I wanted it to, to kind of go down this road. I was, oh, I guess, at high school at some point and the movie Scream had just came out mm -hmm. and I went with a bunch of my girlfriends to um, a small theater in Squirrel Hill. And it was just us, it was, you know, this is the time parents didn't follow us to the movie theater. So it was just us, <laughs> a scary movie. And the it was a, probably the first or second week of its opening. So it was pretty packed. And the way the audience was so animated with the screams, the excitement, the laughter from that movie, and then afterwards, me and my girlfriends walking home, we just talked about that movie probably for the entire 15, 20 minute walk home and hung out outside talking about it. And it was the first time I was ever, I don't know, inundated with a movie that just stuck with me in that way. And of course, it's like a fun horror film, right? I, it, at this point, it's a classic to think about, you mm -hmm. know, the first scream. Um, but it was just one of those movies where after that night, it just stuck with me where I went, wow, I never really, you know, I've watched movies, I've enjoyed movies, but it was the first time I realized how much it can impact a person, their enjoyment, their conversation, uh, just their experience in a theater It together. was the first time you realized it had an emotional impact on you. Right, exactly. And, you know, I think 
I wasn't expecting it from that movie either. You know, like I wasn't expecting it from Scream as silly as that might sound, but it was one of those things that uh, stuck with me. And the next day I went to the library and I pulled out every filmmaking book I could imagine, because of course this is like early days of internet. I couldn't just Google, (laughs) you know, everything I wanted. I had to go to the library and pull out different books and you're, I was you're, you're dating yourself Kara I know it's sad <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah I I was just kind of t- overtaken by that that film and it really sparked my interest in filmmaking in general and I like I said I went to the library I got these books I got filmmaking magazines I got all the lists of best 100 movies and I would go to Blockbuster or the library and re- rent them and watch them and that was sort of you know my while in high school that was my sort of beginning of my education did, into did you want to ri- did you want to write them and direct them too I had no idea what I wanted to do. I wanted you, to be. You just like the involved. idea of production. Yeah, exactly. Like that somebody took this idea and brought it to life and then people enjoyed it in different ways. Um, and so, yeah, that I think that was one of the things too when I went into the world of video film was I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to be in this in some capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of where it all started so, so was the movie point, scream <laughs> i mean that's you know for that to be the movie that triggers it all that's pretty amazing yeah um, at what point then and how far down the road from there was it that you thought to yourself somebody is m- making these decisions to cut together p- little pieces of time as uh jimmy stewart once said <laughs> And put together little pieces of time to make some kind of an emotional impact in a movie. When did you, when did that first dawn on you? Not too long after that. So my parents who have always been amazingly supportive in this creative (laughs) endeavor, you know, most were going, oh, arts and filmmaking, is that where we want to go? My parents were all for it. And so while I was in high school, um, there was a local group here called Pittsburgh Filmmakers at the time, and they offered classes. And this was way before they even offered high school classes. They just kind of offered it to the community and, and Pitt students. And so um, I found out about them and I signed up for one of their classes and we learned how to shoot on eight millimeter film. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so my first editing experience was actually cutting the film. So this is eight eight millimeter, not super eight. It might've been super. Yeah, it was super eight. You're right. It was super eight. Yeah. 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 Um, It was super eight film. So we had a, you know, we shot on film and then we you know, got it processed and brought it in and we were cutting with razors, you know, and, and taping it together, Mm -hmm. um, pulling it back on the reel. And that was my first time I, I shot a silly film. I don't even remember what it was, but I remember that I learned quickly. My first film was awful, um, that I learned quickly. I didn't shoot enough. (laughs) Uh-huh. It was the first time that I learned that I only shot what I thought I needed to, you know, so I only took like one or two takes of something from one angle, um, you know, and that was that part of the story. And then the, the next part of the story was only from one angle from one <laughs> camera. And so that was one of my first things learning as an editor was, oh, I, I just limited myself in telling this story. I only allowed myself to edit this in one particular way and I noticed that once I cut it together and I watched it and of course I was in a class where I was the youngest I, I probably was 15 16 at that time um yeah I had been 15 because my mom <laughs> drove me there I couldn't drive yet <laughs> <laughs> um but most of the people in that class were either college students at Pitt or or older and so you know watching their films and seeing what amazing work they did and then seeing mine and they were all so supportive that was the one thing too I remember was that whole group was very supportive and kind of cheering me on knowing that like hey there's this young kid (laughs) there's no other young kids her age here but she's trying Um, but it was my first time being able to see what editing could do to a story and how I could how I could do it better next time. And it occurred to you from doing that from your experience that one needs coverage you would yes. need different angles. 
Yes, exactly. It's, it's still to this day. It's a difficult <laughs> lesson for a lot of filmmakers to understand that you need to cover it from different angles, unless you know exactly what you're doing for a specific purpose. And that right. happens it's, every once in a while. It does. And I think there was, you know, I understood the different types of shots. You know, I we learned about the wide, medium and close shots and what they can do. And I remember learning that in that class. But I think that's exactly it. I, I felt like I needed to already know that in production or while writing like all right this scene has to be a wide shot only you know this scene is a close-up and when I watched I went oh man you know certain shots I wish I went in closer or certain shots I wish I was at wider and let everybody see the location I was at because it got confusing because sure. we moved to a new location um but yeah it, it was those little things that made me realize from the get-go and every time and I used to tell my students this every time, like, you're going to make mistakes and that's okay. And each time you make the mistakes, like, it doesn't matter. I could tell a student a thousand times, you have to shoot coverage. You have to shoot coverage and they won't, but that's fine because sometimes my voice is not going to be the thing that sticks in their mind. Right. It's going to be that mistake. They go, they shoot it. They don't shoot enough coverage. They quickly learn in the editing. Oh my goodness, I'm <laughs> missing out here on being able to tell my story in the right capacity and the right emotional journey I want to take my audience on. And I will never do that again. It's they have to sort of make that mistake to get it to stick into their their mind. And and that's exactly what happened in that moment. And I will say, every production since then, I I always make sure I get almost maybe too much coverage. That's that's the you, new thing. If I have you to have learn. too much, you can let let it be on the floor on the cutting room floor. Exactly. It so, just makes so, productions longer, if you, especially if you have to wrap by a certain time. Well, you know, as much education is good, and I believe in education and going to school and learning that way. There is absolutely no substitute for real world experience. So true. No, I mean, just so true. no substitute for it whatsoever. So, all right, for listeners who don't know what an editor does, <laughs> um, in basic, what would you say is the editor's primary function? What do editors do on a motion picture, be it short, you know, short form or long form? What is it that editors do? Well, I, I, I would say if you asked most editors this everyone's going to have a different answer to it well that's my, why that's why we have you here to hear yeah. your, your answer <laughs> in my perspective is that they are doing the final rewrite of the, the film mm -hmm. they're the ones taking everything you know i i always said that the film is created in in three stages you have the writing stage where the screenwriter is writing the story and bringing it to life on paper then you take it into production and you have an entire crew bringing it to life, you know, in on film, uh, visually, with sound, all of those capacity. And then the editor takes all of that and starts to string it together. And when you do, sometimes that's where you start to realize, hey, that scene that we shot a certain way or we, it was written a certain way doesn't quite work or it doesn't quite work at this moment in the story. Maybe it's here, or maybe we cut out these lines. You know, the, the writer wrote a bunch of dialogue, but this actor was so amazing. They showed it all on their face. I don't need the dialogue. And the, the editor works with the director and makes those decisions to, to take those things out of there. And so I really see that the, the editor starts to really rewrite everything, bring it together, rewrite it, and bring it to life and take and make sure they're taking the audience on an emotional journey from the start to finish. If there's ever a boring part, that is the editor's job to decide, is that necessary? Um, and it why, doesn't, why, when is, I say, why is boring bad? <laughs> well, boring is bad depending on how you're, you're seeing it. I'm not saying a quiet moment or a slow moment. It's no, boring. Bo boring like, is specific. Boring is yes. specific. We don't boring. want them to be bored, do we? The exactly. Um, boring is if it it's not moving the story forward. There's no reason for that moment in a film. It's confusing your audience. Anything like that, it needs to be cut out. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I used to tell the students too this all the time. It doesn't matter if you spent two days shooting this entire scene because it was the most magnificent location and you had like a drone going and you had all these extras and all these great things 
I'm sorry. Like if that scene is boring, my audience is putting them to sleep. It's confusing them. It doesn't help move the story forward. Uh, it has to go. And uh, that was, you know, for new editors, it's always new filmmakers. It's always a difficult concept, but then eventually they start to, to realize it's, it's kind of the, the necessary thing that needs to be done. So no scene is too long if it holds your attention and no yeah. scene can be too short if it's boring. Right. Exactly. You know, that's <laughs> you just want... the way that works. Yeah, exactly. Like as long as you're keeping the audience engaged in some capacity, like it, keep it in there. So but... do, you, do you think an editor can improve a story that is less than well produced or maybe oh. screw up something that's magnificently produced? <laughs> Definitely. I've seen both. <laughs> Um, I've seen both where I've seen, and you know, I've seen this book professionally and I will say a maybe even a little bit more on the student side where you might have a great story, but maybe production didn't bring it to life as well, or the actor wasn't as great as they had hoped or anything like that. And then the editor starts to put it together. It's difficult, you know, the, the editor has a lot of work to do, but with time and real focus, they can bring it to life. They can decide on that different coverage. You know, when do I, let's say if it is an actor that isn't, you know, really bringing the character to life, maybe they're not using that character on screen and close-ups often. Maybe they're keeping them a little further apart they're they're sticking with the better character to to keep the audience engaged in some capacity and not mm -hmm. throw them out of the reality of that film world mm -hmm. um so yeah so an editor can certainly take things that maybe weren't so great tighten it up find the best parts of it and and, and try to string together a solid story but then too, I've seen where, you know, production has had everything and it's a solid story and maybe the editor just isn't as experienced and they let scenes play too long. They, even though you tell them you probably should get rid of <laughs> that really long, boring scene, it doesn't matter how cool it is, they keep it in. And now your audience is disconnected for five minutes because you made them sit through that boring scene. And it again, it doesn't matter how great the production is, what kind of uh actors you have or celebrities you have if they're bored they're the, it's not going to do anything would, for them. Would they're going to quickly would you off. say that most editors yourself included develop individual philosophies toward how to cut a movie or how to put material together or do you think those philosophies shift from movie to movie oh i think it's a little bit of both i think and it's also the people you're working with too because i will say anytime i've worked with a director or producer on a project I've, I usually learn something from them mm -hmm. or I might get a note, like notes are always difficult because, you know, you might've put all your time and effort into editing something and then you get thrown all these notes and you're like, I don't completely oh, agree. Who doesn't, who doesn't <laughs> love notes being given right, notes yeah. by other people? Yeah. Notes are, notes are challenging for every, at every level. Ev everybody. And I think it, there's a level of it though, that as you get older and you mature and you've done it enough that you realize that at the end of the day, there's something to every note and you shouldn't take them personally. I usually like, if I get it notes, I might read them quickly and then I don't do anything. Like I don't respond immediately. I try not to j dive in and like, be like, I'm right. No, I, I I'm like, you know what? I'm going to read the notes, process them, maybe sleep on them and then go back into them the next day. And usually I have a clear mind of what they're asking. And a lot of times the great thing with digital editing nowadays is that I can do all of the edits that are asked in notes by making a new timeline, like copying my, my timeline and making a new one, making all the changes, even if I don't quite agree, send it to the director producer and say, hey, here, I've implemented your notes. Uh, you know, I might, if I don't completely agree, I might share with them my thoughts like, Hey, I don't know if I'm, this is working for me, but you watch it and let them see what their ideas are. Because I think that's the other their thing is a lot of times when you're working with people, which is such an important part of the editing process, 
you are the only ones most of the time with control to manipulate all the footage and put it in the orders and ideas that you have. And when people give you notes, it's all in their mind. Mm -hmm. So they're just thinking, oh, I think this would work better. And when you tell them, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't agree with you. You're never letting them see that come to life. It's only playing perfectly in their mind. And that's going to cause friction where if you just take a moment and bring it to life to them, they might have some great idea that you didn't think of. I've had it where I, you read the note and I'm like, this is not going to work. I do. And I'm like, Oh, that was, that was pretty good. Okay. I, 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 yeah, I see where they're coming. And then there's other times where I, I do their note send it to them. And then they, um, come back and they're like, yeah, no, I see what you mean. Let's go back to, to my edit. Or we do a kind of a combination of both. So, um, I think that's really an important pro- part of the process is seeing what you can bring to it yourself as an editor, but working closely with everybody else and taking in their feedback and, and sort of creating your own kind of style, but not, not being restricted to just your style or just the way you've done it before, because every project is different. Every person you work with is different. My experience has been that, um, that people have sometimes trouble seeing something in their mind's eye that actually works, that frequently it somehow works in their head or they're nodding off to sleep and it's the most beautiful storytelling and imagery they've ever seen in their life. And then they try to actually make it work and it doesn't for whatever reason. You know, you said it earlier that editors are the final writers of the movie. And so my question is, and it's an important one for, from my perspective, how important is it for editors to understand that they are actually storytellers? Oh, it's, it's extremely important. <laughs> like I, I, and I think it's not even just important for editors to know this. I think it's important for everyone in the industry to realize all that. Filmmakers, all filmmakers. Uh, yeah. I think that there was this misconception, especially in the early days of filmmaking where a lot of the first editors were women and as film sort of became this more artistic, creative endeavor, you saw more men come into play. Um, but if you kind of look at some of these history books, they're kind of like, well, it was given to women because it was more sort of like factory work, you know, like sewing or something like they can quickly put it together. But these women were the first really putting together some of these ideas that we know today where if I'm putting two images together, it has a larger meaning. You know, if I see it, you know, it's called the Kuleshov effect, but um, I'm working on this YouTube course right now. And uh, the the guy, this guy edits YouTube channel. He has a video called the Kuleshov effect is wrong or something along those lines. And it kind of talks about this process that women editors back in the day we're doing this, but it's kind of assigned to him the idea of let's take one shot of a person, you know, and then that's just a shot of one person. But when you connect it to a shot of something else, and I think it's like a bowl of food, right? And then you cut back to that shot of the person, the audience immediately thinks they're hungry. But if you watched, looked at each of the shots by themselves, there's no connection, but it's with the art of editing. When you put it together, it has a stronger power. But if I switched out that bowl of food and put in, you know, a little baby. Now it's a, like a loving father, doting father, or somebody like that. Um, the juxtaposition so, of images. Exactly. And so it has such a, like an amazing power in knowing that everything you're putting together, you are building the story. Editing is not just a technical, uh, job. It's not knowing how to you know, you, yes, you do need to know how to work Adobe or Avid or Final Cut, whatever you're working in. But at the end of the day, you need to know how to tell a great story. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the art part. What you were just alluding to is the mechanical part, understanding Avid or the machinery or a steam back from the old days or whatever it was. That's the mechanic. (laughs) That's the mechanical part. But as an editor, you're being, you're, fulfilling an artist's dream of some kind and so you have to have an artistic sensibility 
Yeah. I, you know, I just saw a tweet about this, but I, I laughed when I saw it because I'm like, man, I've been saying this for years, especially to my students is, um, and no offense to you. Cause I know you're a screenwriter, but I, <laughs> I, 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 I quickly learned I was not a screenwriter. I did not want to write scripts from the beginning, but I still, you know, took my screenwriting classes and learn, you know, the different structures, story structures. Um, but I feel like being an editor, I learned even more about the screenwriting process because I'm sitting there building these different acts and these sure. structures and deciding on what dialogue I keep or how much space I keep before somebody responds to a piece of dialogue or when do I cut to that close up? You know, I want to make sure I'm cutting to that close up at an emotional time. I don't want my entire scene to be close ups the whole time because if it's close ups the whole time, I'm losing the power of it. So if I'm in a medium shot and only use that close up and that like one important line or, you know, that key, you know, moment of a scene, all of a sudden I'm bringing that, that scene to life with my coverage. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I feel like has given me the, the opportunity to learn how to tell, tell stories. Um, every edit, I feel like I get a little better. And then I also learned something new too along the way. <laughs> You're always learning. You're always growing. Oh, always, always. <laughs> and at the minute that you think you aren't growing anymore, you really have a problem. Oh, yeah. And I think that's the other thing, too, with editors kind of going back to the technical side of it. Um, my students used to not love to learning at Abbott. Most of them came into school knowing Final Cut or we learned we would teach a premiere, Adobe Premiere. For those who don't know, or, these are editing yeah. programs. Yeah, exactly. Editing software. So, and there's tons of them out there and it's changed a lot, even since I've been uh, editing and, you know, the students would kind of go, Oh, I don't want to, I'm fine with just premiere. And I would go, well, a couple of things first. So you're going to tell a job, you're not going to take it because you don't like premiere or you don't like Avid or you don't like whatever they're requiring you to cut on. Cause mm -hmm different productions are going to already have what they want to work on. You know, it's, it's, it's not often you get to just pick and choose your editing unless you're, you know, freelancer on your own. Um, and so I said, you, you should got to learn everything. I said, but two, you can't just, you know, put yourself in a corner with just one type of technical software because it's software. It's, going to change, gonna you change. know, when I, I started, you know, I started it with a uh, super eight and then I learned how to, to, uh, linear editing with, uh, tapes, you know, I like basically videotapes at that time where I would use the machine and I had to write down my time code on it. So, uh, it was all kind of very analog based. And then I moved into what was called final cut seven and that software went away it, it sort of just went completely away several years later and it upset the industry a bit but I never put myself into just knowing one software I learned them all because my skill was sure I can learn the technical that's not difficult but I should be able to do the same type of artistry no matter what my tool is 100 percent yeah it's just a tool those are the tools yeah but you are the artist and that you carry from job to job and equipment to equipment. Um, exactly. Is it, is it possible for an editor to be successful if they have no sense of pace and rhythm? I think if you're starting out, a lot of new editors have that trouble, but it is a natural thing that you, you, you either have or you don't, but it, it can I be also developed tell, further. It, it can, can be, be exactly. I always used to say that to, to students where, you know, maybe you don't have the rhythm, just like think of a musician or a dancer, right? Uh, they're practicing. If they really want to do that, if they want to figure out that rhythm, the proper rhythm, the, you know, the, the flow that they're, they want to tell their, their story and music or dance, they practice. That's the same with an editor. And, you know, a lot of times your first edits, like mine, where I learned, I didn't have enough coverage. My cuts were too long. You know, it was too slow. You learn that after time when you start to look at each of your, your, 
you know, films that you make or things that you cut and you quickly realize like, oh, okay. Yeah. I, this does feel slow to me. And you start to trust your instinct. You know, I always said, trust your gut on it, watch it. I always, uh, I will watch mine in a couple of ways too, even now, like I'm working on a project. It's still in the very uh, rough cut stage, but I will watch the edit without any audio and just watch the cuts. Mm -hmm. And it gives me kind of a sense where I'm only kind of watching it visually and I can sort of feel the flow through the cuts. And I almost will put markers. I'm like, this feels a little too long or that feels too short. And then I turn the music back on and watch those moments again. And I'll go, okay, maybe it's okay with the music, it kind of the music or sound uh, design enhances it. Um, but if it doesn't, I'm like, oh yeah, this is too slow. You know, it helps me tighten it up. I also will watch a lot of my cuts on different screens. So I will watch it on, you know, export it and I'll put it on my big television screen downstairs because if I've been watching it only on my monitor or I'll even export it and watch it on my phone. And mm. so again, just those different screens kind of give you a different perspective. And I, most of the time I'm watching it for the rhythm and the pace because mm -hmm. that different view all of a sudden allows my instincts to, to sort of change and go, Oh yeah, this is not feeling right. Or this this can be tightened. And the one thing, and I don't even remember where I learned this, but the one thing that I try to do when I'm reviewing my cuts, whether it's a rough cut or whatever, is I'm really bad at, as soon as I see a bad part, I pause it <laughs> <laughs> because then I want to go fix it. Right. And I try to tell myself not to pause it, you know, just put a mark on there on your timeline, which you can do in a lot of the editing software. So I know to go back to that moment or review it. But I feel like every time you're pausing it, you're sort of putting the brakes on that rhythm and pace where you just got to let it play out, take note of what works and what doesn't, and then go back in and do the, you know, the jarring <laughs> stop, go, stop, go. When I, when I have been on airplanes, where it was a long flight and they would show a movie and there'd be a single movie today that frequently you get multiple movies on your own individual screen. But not too long ago, there would be a single movie <laughs> shown on a, on a, on a plane as you've traveled across the country. And I would never take the headphones. I would always watch the movie with no sound. And I would watch to see if I understood what was going on. Of course, I'm not talking about movies I've never seen before. And I would look, if I understood what was going on, I knew the filmmakers had done a good job. So true. It I is always so true. knew because the, because the picture telling was all I needed. I didn't need dialogue. I didn't need, if, if they were showing me what I needed to see, then I could understand the story. And I this think you're, so you're alluding to something similar with pace and rhythm. You, you If you can see it without sound, then... And, and it works, then you know you have yeah. something that's working properly. Um, it, do you believe that editors and directors should plan a cut prior to production? In other words, is it advisable for editors to start with a clear goal before you even start to cut? Personally, I think it's not a bad idea. Um, I, you know, before I ever start on a project, I love to have the script or the transcripts, if it's interviews, just to start to get an idea of what, you know, I kind of will put it down on paper. And, I, you know, I do, I'd say a lot more interview documentary corporate type stuff nowadays. And so if I transcribe the interviews that I know we're keeping or whatever there, there's something about reading it on paper and being able to highlight those moments where I'm like, oh, that is a line of dialogue. That's the hats. That's key. Or, oh, that's a great line. I want to keep that. Or that's a great moment in the script, you know? And even if it's before production, it gives me a heads up of, I really hope, you know, say if it's a film, man, that one line, I hope they get that in a close up, And that I also have coverage before that so that then I could cut to a close up at that moment and make it even more powerful or that I'm given enough coverage to be able to build the scene out. So I think there is a level of it that any pre-production is great. And I've heard that more and more editors are being brought in to pre-production. Back in the day, that might not have been the case. The editor usually came 
closer, you know, during production or towards wrap. Do you think that's because um, back then directors would shoot whatever they shot and then they would go into the editing room with the editor and dictate everything they wanted to be done? Yes, there are those, you know, and I think, and I don't know that this was always the case. I know that there are editor director partnerships that have had amazing, you know, collaborative relationships well, forever. Steven, yeah. <laughs> Steven Spielberg and Michael Kahn, for example. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Martin Scorsese and Thelma Schumacher. Exactly. So there's tons of those, but then I've also heard that there are the directors who would basically have it planned out to a T and they would tell their editor, this is what you're going to do. I think Hitchcock might've been one that oh, well, was like well, that. Yeah. For sure. Hitchcock, hundred yeah. percent for sure. And for sure, Kubert. Yeah. They, they absolutely knew exactly cut for cut, moment for moment, what they were doing before they shot the movie. Exactly. And so I think there's, it's going to be different depending on what production you are on, but that's the other thing too, is where, where you see producers or directors sort of working with the same editors quite often. And they might change every other person in their production, mm -hmm, but they mm -hmm. bring on that editor because there is a really special relationship that you sort of almost have to know what that person's the director as an editor, you have to know what the director or producer is thinking and like know what they like what but also know where you can push back and maybe bring some creative ideas to the table as well where you can go i don't know if you really would like this but i have this idea you know that's a little bit more difficult for a brand new editor with a brand new director who maybe don't have that that kind of a relationship right so uh, aside from the obvious which is you've read a script you're the editor you've read the script you've had whatever consultations you've had with the director and perhaps the producers. Um, and, and then you finally get all this footage and you start your, I guess, your process of deciding what are we labeling it? How are we putting it together and so on? Is there anything that you must know or you must have in your, in your basket, so to speak, before you start to cut? Is there anything that you must know beyond those basic things? To me, I think you, you really need to know your story. And the other thing is too, is once you've had, get all of the media in and depending on who you're working with, you might have assistants who organize the footage for you and you kind of just come in and sit down and, and watch the footage. My personal preference is I love to watch every single piece of footage in a project. Even the outtakes? Even the outtakes. I watch it all. I know that one, some editors don't like to do that. And two, some tight deadlines, especially in TV productions, that's just not possible to be able to do. But this um, is this has really changed with with video and electronic shooting because in the old days they would only print those things that they called yeah. the print. But now exactly. you can see everything. Yeah, you can watch it all, which you know it's good and bad in some ways. And one, you can take, you know, make record hundreds of takes of one scene over and over again, and you're giving your editor tons of options, but that might be too many options for them to even process. Uh, but at the same time, you're giving the editor everything, you know, they don't have to make that decision right away going up, oh, print just this take and maybe this take. They have everything at their you know, at the capacity to be able to uh, go and watch again, see, you know what, I don't like now that I put built this scene, I don't like this performance very much. Is there a better shot of, you know, this or a better delivery of this line? And now you can quickly go back. But that was where I like to know all my footage, because I love looking at the outtakes, because your outtakes might have a, you know, a reaction that actually is more natural right something <laughs> that, something quirky or just quirky. natural reaction yeah yeah you take the audio out of it and you bring it in and you make it you make it work for that um but the other thing is too is this way you know everything that the director has to offer because a lot of times directors will come in and be like you know what there was this one performance and i i think i want to see that in there you know of and you hopefully have seen that already and you know where to pull it up and you quickly bring it up. Hopefully your project is organized. You can quickly bring it up and, and put it right in there. Um, 
the other thing is too, is I always liked to know the story, know all of my footage, organize it in the best capacity possible. And then when, then I can start editing and now I'm in the creative realm. And when I'm in the creative realm, because I know everything, my uh, creative flow is not stopped by me having to look and dig for something. Cause I'm like, uh, let me look at all these different performances now. I've already looked at them. I know in the back of my mind what's there. Um, and I could quickly go, oh yeah, there was a second take that I liked and I know where that lives already because I maybe made a note of it or I right. changed the color of the file. And that keeps my creative flow going. So when I'm in that that mindset, um, I'm not stopping it at all. I, I I can actually do the fun part, which I always call the fun part is <laughs> being able to actually do the, you know, build the story, bring it to life. So you, f- frequently, and we'll go back to the question about pace and rhythm and timing mm-hmm. and all those things that a good editor has to have. Part of that is sometimes driven by the soundtrack or the or the score of the movie, not just the soundtrack, but the score itself. And frequently that score is not brought until the very last minute. You don't get that score till way deep in, especially in television. You may not get it till really at the very, very last minute. And so my so sometimes editors will put in what are called temp tracks. Are you a Mm -hmm. believer in temp tracks to help with rhythm and pace? I, you know, I, I do it all the time and I've had to lose my temp tracks and bring in something different or bring in the real Does track. Does it screw and, you up? Do you have to go back yeah, and get cut? Yeah. One of our, you know, past colleagues, Andrew always called it temp love. You want to make sure you don't fall in love with that mm-hmm. temp track too much mm-hmm. that all of a sudden when you have to bring in the real track or you, you, you know, have a different piece of music you have to use that you sort of don't put yourself in a bad mindset now going, Oh, this is awful. Right. Cause you, you fell in love with that old track. So I think it's not a bad thing. I, I I think there's two avenues you can take with music and I've done both of them where I will focus on the edit without the music, because I want to get the rhythm and the pace of that edit at a place where without the music, Mm -hmm it works. Right. The, the, the tempo, the cuts, how long I kept something on screen. Um, it feels right. And that when I add the music that fits all of a sudden, hopefully that music enhances my edit. It doesn't mean that I won't tweak the edit a little bit, maybe to match a beat of the song or whatever, but my edit is tight enough that when I add that music, it just, it, it's at an all, all new level. But then I have had productions where the music's so key and I might have had issues trying to find the rhythm and pacing, but as soon as I put the music in there, the music sort of dictates that rhythm and pacing and helps me figure out where to place a cut or how long to keep something on there. So there's two avenues and I, there's no right or wrong. It's going to be different depending on what production. And the other thing, thinking of rhythm and editing that I always love to point out that newer editors, newer filmmakers not might not realize is there's two types of rhythm. And I can't remember for the life of me who kind of has put these two terms out there, but mm-hmm. you have your external rhythm, which you are creating with your cuts, right? If I put a lot of cuts, it's going to be a really fast pace, right? You're, you're making all the cuts go by really fast. All the information's going by really fast. The audience has to process it fast, or they might get confused, depending. If I keep a shot on there long, now I'm slowing down the pace in some capacity. But then that's external rhythm. Then we have internal rhythm that I think some don't keep in mind is that everything happening on screen in your shot has rhythm to it as well. You know, the pacing of the the people are talking or the way they're walking Maybe the way the camera is moving, if it's, you know, panning back and forth or tilting, you know, up and down, um, that all has a rhythm to that movement in it. And so you have to keep that in mind as well, because, you know, if I have lots of fast internal rhythm happening on screen and then I'm adding fast cuts to it, 
that's going to be crazy and hectic. And if that's what you want in your scene, because, you know, it's a thriller or you want to confuse your audience or something like that. Great. But, you know, depending on what the, the genre is or the story that you're telling, if you're not taking into account the external rhythm with the internal rhythm and they're sort of fighting each other, your audience is going to feel that. And they might not understand why something feels off you know, cause they aren't filmmakers or editors, but they, especially nowadays, audiences are smart. They have been visual, uh, taking in the visual story most of their life, if not all their lives, especially, right, sure. you know, in, in some capacity and yeah, they might be able to take in faster cuts, but at the same time, if you've confused them or you're making them notice your cuts and not the story, they're no longer engaged. Mm -hmm. So editing and filmmaking in general comes with an enormous number of pressures. There's <laughs> deadline pressure, there's pressure to create a good work, there's all these pressures. How do you deal with pressure? What do you do? <laughs> I don't know. You, you don't? You just <laughs> collapse into a puddle just, of uh, I, goo in a corner? Yeah, I just cry. No, okay. <laughs> Most of the time, I feel like I've gotten better under pressure as I've gotten older, you know, um, I feel like when I have a deadline coming up, that pressure almost brings out the creative juices <laughs> for me. But at the same time, like well, that's the so, old, that's the old John Wayne line. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And I feel like that <laughs> has always been my, you know, give me that deadline and I have to, I'll, I'll get it done. Do you prefer um, a deadline? Do you like deadlines? I do, you know, I do like, and, and even if I don't have a strict deadline, I try to put one on myself, but at the same time, sometimes when there's that pressure, that's deadline, you can sort of hit a creative wall and you're like, I have no idea how to do this. I don't know how to fix it. I, I, you know, your, your brain almost is like, I and think what, my and brain's what do you broken. Do? Do, you, do you walk away for a while? Do you get a little I perspective? I do. I do. I, if I, if I, it's possible, I try to walk away. If I have somebody I'm working with uh, and I'm stuck, sometimes I will send it their way and I'll be like, Hey, you know, watch this edit, review this for me. Uh, give me your thoughts. Right. Cause I need to go to sleep or I need to take a walk. <laughs> right. Um, and a lot of times once I've had that little moment to breathe or I get some feedback from somebody, um, typically I'm in a place where I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And even if the pressure's kind of coming down on me, I feel like that little breathe breather that I had given me the, you know, the mindset to be like, all right, I got this. I can, I can, get this done so it's so it is a question of sometimes trying to get a little bit of a distance from what you were working on so that your brain can sort of re, re <laughs> i guess reprocess refocus yeah. reset i guess would be a good way yeah. to say it if you uh, can you know sometimes i and i've had it where you know the deadline i i've had people give me notes back and but they're like we still need this at like <laughs> midnight or something in, in, you know, in two ridiculous. hours right yeah <laughs> and at that point it's just you do everything in your power to put the blinders on and just focus and do and what you, the best you, you can you have to let your professional instincts kick in at that point and just trust that what you're doing is going to work somehow definitely I, and I, I think and I feel like too I Every time I've put something out there, I don't think I've ever put out a project that I'm like, that was amazing. I did such an amazing job. I'm so like, <laughs> never you can, you can see life. where all the, you, you see where all the stitches go, you know, oh, just, if only I had cut day. this one shot different, if only I'd done that. Yeah. We all see that every artist of any salt thinks that their work is never as good as others oh. do when people really hold it up to the light. So yeah. Uh, and, and we see that all the time with great artists, people like um, Spielberg himself probably would go back and change things in his early movies because he looks back and goes, wait a minute, I could have done that better if I only had shot it that way or this way and so on. I'm going to ask you a question I ask a lot of guests that I think is a, a, an interesting question to get answers to. And it's not an easy question. And the question is, what for you, from your perspective, makes a good story good? My main thing is, if it keeps me engaged, if I'm hooked, 
if I am hooked and I want to keep watching, Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like I am a bad watcher now. I don't know if it's like the world of YouTube or Netflix or TikTok. Like I have become bad where if you have not engaged me or kept my attention, I'm I'm moving on. There's something else I can watch. You better. you have a remote control. You can go to the next thing. <laughs> right. Like I I want a story that's going to to keep me engaged. And I I don't know. I and I don't know if this is just from teaching where I'm I'm for, more forgiving too. If the camera works not the greatest, I, I, maybe I'm a little pickier with editing. I notice every edit, like that's the one thing about editing is it ruins you. Like I've noticed every <laughs> cut, it doesn't matter how amazing this, you know, <laughs> editor is, the story is, I'm going to notice every cut and how you've structured it. And especially when I started teaching, that was always my, it was actually bad. I would watch TV or films and I'd be like, oh, that was an amazing example. I need to find a way to, for me to download that to show my the class, you know? Um, but yeah, I'd say my, my thing with a story is if you can keep me engaged, uh, you keep me hooked and and wanting to know what's going to happen next. You've got me like, you, that's you an amazing that's, story. Do you think that's mainly conflict that if it's, it's filled with conflict, that's what engages you or is it other things? Is it? Yeah. Conflict, uh, the dramatic question, you know, like what will happen, you know? Yeah. I think that's next? what mm-hmm. will happen next. You know, it's called um, suspense. Suspense. Exactly. <laughs> in, indeed. So I need to, to ask you before we uh, wrap this thing up a little bit about Edit Mentor. What is Edit yeah. Mentor and how does it work? Edit Mentor uh, is a project that I've been working with for almost two years now, and I absolutely love it. Um, it is a um, web-based uh, editing software that teaches students the art of visual storytelling. Um, It allows students to go into the program and learn about things like we've talked about today, shot coverage. Why would you use a shot coverage? Uh, You get to actually edit things in it. So you can do trims, you can delete things, you can place markers, and it asks you questions with each sequence you see on the timeline. And you learn from what your edits, hey, you did a really great job there. Oh, maybe you could have, you know, done this a little better here or there. So it's all, you know, gamified. So you have, you get scores and what do when you, you finish a course, you get a certificate. Ex- explain by gamified. What does that mean? Gamified is making it a game, you know, <laughs> uh, making the learning process a game in that when you, you have a question, you learn something, you have a question presented to you, you take action and the, the game is in like an editing software. Uh, you, you do, you put your answer in there in some capacity and the system gives you a score back and it tells you, you did great. And so at the end of it, you know, it's each of our lessons are out of 100. You can figure out like, Hey, I got 100. Maybe you didn't get as well. You can try everything over again. Um, and so it's an, educational software. A lot of schools are using it, but we also have uh, the option for uh, life learners to use it. So anyone can create a free account and and give it a try. But we have multiple courses out there now. We have two art of filmmaking, so a basic and intermediate that teaches a lot of things we talked about. And it's not just editing concepts too. We do go into story structure, scene perspective, different shot coverage. Then we um, have an advanced editing course by ACE editor, uh, Stephen Marks, who uh, edited for X-Files and Deadwood and a bunch of other great shows. Um, He did this course for us and he teaches, you know, a more advanced thought process in terms of the editing, but we break down scripts. We learn what a line script is and you're facing pages and different coverage that you can look at. And you basically work with him one-on-one to build a, a short film together. Do you actually, see do, it, do students actually make a movie while they're doing this? So they don't make a movie, so, you know, but they can. Um, so at the end of the majority of our courses, we offer, um, the raw footage for different projects that they can download and then they can take into their own 
editing system preference and edit that uh, project themselves. So after they've learned everything in Edit Mentor, now they can go in and bring it to life. And um, Edit Mentor's uh, parent company is called Edit Stock. And that's how I got involved with them. I was using Edit Stock in my editing classrooms for years, where they uh, sell short film, short different projects, documentaries, so that students can practice editing with professional footage, whether it's a commercial, a short film, documentaries, and those. And so we use a lot of those in Edit Mentor, as well as giving to the students after they finish the course, that media so that they continue their learning. But our main thing with Edit Mentor is that this is not just for those who want to do filmmaking or want to be an editor. Nowadays, there isn't a moment that goes by that you are not watching a video of some sort, mm -hmm. whether it's something on Facebook or TikTok or YouTube, or you have these amazing libraries with Netflix, Hulu, everything you at your fingertips. And so it's sort of a visual language that everyone understands and they just don't understand how they're using this footage to tell the story. Um, and so that's what we're hoping to do is sort of make these impactful uh, lessons that teaches anyone how to be a visual storyteller and how they could take whatever footage that they are shooting or using and tell great stories. We wrapped up at the end of, uh, at the beginning of the summer, a broadcast journalism course. And we are working on, and hopefully we'll have done here in the next few weeks, a YouTube uh, course where we're teaching sort of the structure, the story structure of building a YouTube video. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, so this, this, does it take the place of going to a full-fledged university or something like that? Or, or, or is it, is it not that full-fledged? No, I'd say this doesn't replace a classroom in any capacity. Like our main, uh, our main, uh, our main school level that is using it right now are a lot of high schoolers. We have some middle schoolers, some universities. Um, and I always tell the teacher that Edit Mentor is not looking to replace you or your classroom because in filmmaking, hands-on learning is necessary. Mm -hmm. You need to go out there and, and get a camera, shoot footage, bring it back together, build a story from scratch. Um, and so a lot of our courses, you know, we hopefully are going to be supplemental material that will only help the teachers or help life learners who are looking to get started in there to give them sort of the, the basis of where to start. And that way they can then go out and, and do what they need to. But if it's like a classroom, um, yeah, we don't, you know, we still see the importance of having assignments where you're shooting the footage, you're telling the story, you're, you're creating the new story and, and putting it together. But mm -hmm. hopefully our curriculum and our material will help you take whatever you're building to the next level. Well, that's, that sounds very useful for anyone who's trying to become some, some kind of filmmaker, even if on a small scale, not necessarily a Hollywood scale. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, hey, if you are the Hollywood style, if you're at the very beginning of your journey, this is a great place to start because our art of filmmaking and then Stephen's course, Stephen Mark's course for the advanced editing. I mean, he is telling you his insider secret after being an editor for uh, some of the most major television shows in the world. He's learned a lot of uh, a lot of tips and tricks. And when we were building that course, uh, Misha Tenenbaum, who is the owner and CEO of Edit Mentor, and myself, we would watch all of Steven's video as we were building this curriculum. And the entire time we're like, oh, that's an amazing piece of wisdom. Oh, that's, and both Misha and I have been editing for probably the last 20 years each. And just hearing things that Steven was sharing in his course was amazing. It was just you might be something we knew, but it was just this different approach that we never took. So, uh, yeah, we, it, it's been so much fun to take the two passions, editing and teaching and bring them to life within this new learning model. Nice. Well, nice. So I have been speaking with, uh, the great editor and teacher, 
uh, Kara Freeze for an hour now, and we're going to wind this thing down a little bit. So I'm just curious, you, you've clearly met tons of people in the entertainment industry and certain number of people in the university systems and academia. And I, I'm just wondering, are you able to share with us a story that's either weird, strange, quirky, offbeat, oddball, or maybe <laughs> just plain funny? Yeah, I actually picked a story that was before I even worked in the industry when I was learning um, right. that uh, it, it still to this day is one of those that everyone's sort of like, wow, did not expect that. Um, one of my very first production classes in college had us doing a documentary. And at this point, I hadn't done many productions, very short things. So this is going to be my first main film that I was producing, directing. I had a camera person with me who was going to help shoot. And I decided to hang out at a tattoo parlor for my documentary to talk about this world of, you know, tattoo artists. And this is way before, like, this is early 2000s. So this is before your reality shows that have covered this, you know, and have really shined a spotlight on it. And it was great. Um, and I got some amazing interviews. That was my first time really interviewing people too. And noticing like, oh, I love this. I love talking to people and getting their stories out, getting B-roll uh, with my camera operator uh, of the tattoo parlor. And I would ask different people that came in, hey, can I shoot you getting your tattoo? And they were like, oh, just for a second or two. And they were always also nervous. You know, it didn't matter how much I like tried to persuade them. And I really wanted to show the story of, you know, somebody coming in, get deciding on a tattoo, the tattoo artist, artist's process. Like I wanted to show it from start to finish. And I was just hitting every wall. And I had been at this place for four days and this was like my first film. I wanted to, to do it justice. And so I uh, went ahead and just said, I'll be it. And I'll get a tattoo. I had, I had no planning ahead of time. <laughs> and I said to the tattoo artist, I said, I'll pay for it. You know, like I'm not expecting this for free. He's like, yeah, sure. And the, the guy that was with me, who was another student in the class was like, his eyes were in pure shock the whole time. He's like, Kara, <laughs> you need to think about, you can't just put a tattoo on yourself. <laughs> and I said, well, I can't, I don't have a story without this part. Like, this is what I've planned. This is the story. Like, I want to show this process. Um, and so, yeah, I, I did it. I decided on a, a star on my hip and we shot the whole thing and got all of this amazing footage. I was like the the guy who was shooting the footage was amazing too. Like he got in some close-ups, but they're are disgusting. They're so bloody. <laughs> like gross. But like he even got like a close-up at one point where you could see the needle going right into oh, my skin. Yeah. <laughs> So then we, uh, at my school at the time, we only had two editing systems and I told Nathan who I was working with, I said, we're editing this is he was my co-editor as when nobody else is around. I don't want anybody to see this. And so then when we finally finished it, we showed it in class and nobody had any idea that it was, and it was the gasp when they saw that I was getting a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> that was, and the teacher at the time was like, I guess I got to give you an A. <laughs> and I mean, I, we got, we got great feedback and remarks and I still have that project, which is crazy. I still have that uh, project on my server. And, and you still have the tattoo, it. I assume. I still have the tattoo. And you have more so than one, don't you? Now I have three tattoos, but that was my very first one with no planning, no thought to it. <laughs> <laughs> and I got it all recorded. Well, now that's what that's what I call a dedicated filmmaker. Yes. Get in there <laughs> right and stick the yourself right in the middle of it all. <laughs> that's when I knew, like, all right, this is the this is the field for me. I'm not changing. <laughs> all right, last question for today, Kara. What's the um, if if someone's starting out, what's your best piece of advice or tip to give someone who's just starting out in the business, or maybe? They've been in a little while and they're trying to get to the next level. I mean, you've given us tons of great advice, but do you have a single solid piece of advice? 
Yeah, I, we briefly mentioned it earlier, but I always say never stop learning, um, especially in this industry. And I'm not even saying filmmaking. Obviously, it's great to continue watching films, shows, get ideas of what else is out there in the world, but learn other industries too, other topics, read books, continue expanding your mind because art from all over or just different types of industries, they'll give you ideas on what you can bring to your next project too, whether it's a story or the way that they've presented information. Um, but also too, you know, keeping yourself learning just keeps your mind fresh and you keep, you know, you're, you're going to stay young that way. I, I feel like as, as long as you're learning, you're always going to stay young. I feel like every morning I typically will watch something from, um, like a you, new YouTube video or a Linda video or masterclass or something that's brand new and out of my wheelhouse. Like for example, I was watching a, like a whole series about interior decoration and the like colors, the ways you, you can use colors in your room. But that all of a sudden gave me ideas on how I can maybe build graphics or how I set up a scene thinking of the way that an interior decorator mixes textures and colors, I could do the same thing in my art. And I might not have gotten that idea if I wasn't willing to to keep learning. That's such a great, great idea and a very good tip that it it never hurts to keep learning and to get different perspectives on life in general, which then mm-hmm. sometimes opens up whole new realms of possibility for you as an artist. Exactly. Yep. Kara Freeze, this has been a fantastic hour plus on StoryBeat today, and I'm so grateful for spending a little time with you, my friend. And I'm just, I'm just truly delighted that you spent time here today. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. You made this this so easy, so thank you so much. And so we've come to the end of today's StoryBeat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.